Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Julian. Uh, thanks for coming to class. And uh, hopefully I make it worth your while. And um, for those of you who are online, welcome. I um, much prefer that you be here in person as well, but feel free to use the chat or interject if you, if you want to. Um, uh, so I, before I start a lecture series, I like to um, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that UNSW and this lecture hall is sitting on, which is the Bidjigal people of the Eora, Eora Nation. And I like to pay my respects to uh, elders past and present and ancestors and um, acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. Um, so what you've done with Paul so far has been uh, thermal physics. And I always found thermal physics kind of difficult. You may have found the same thing. Uh, maybe not. Maybe you guys are, are good at thermal physics. For me, statistical mechanics is, is, is like way easier, right? So I really would like encourage you to take a deep breath and just let thermal physics out a little bit as you breathe out and breathe in the goodness of statistical physics instead. Welcome, come in. Um, so the difference here is that here we sort of have a different set of postulates, a different set of axioms, and it leads us back to thermal physics eventually. Um, doesn't take that long actually. And we will use the, some of the results we've gotten from thermal physics, but really that's just to make a connection back to the physics that we already know from thermal physics. So we, when we use those things, um, it's to, to kind of get back um, to, to, the, to, uh, you know, to the physical uh, notions that we already have. So ideas like pressure and uh, volume and temperature, entropy, all of those things are all like things that have been developed in thermal physics, they're true. And so what we do in statistical mechanics is develop an entirely different framework, which will connect back to that. Okay. Um, so uh, one of the things that always bugged me about thermal physics is uh, what is entropy? This thing, entropy kind of appears in our equations. We know it has to exist, but it's not really well defined what it is. Yeah. Um, and there's like a bunch of like hand waving kind of ideas. This is my opinion, not, not fact. In my opinion, there's a bunch of hand wavy ideas about what entropy is and what it means. Uh, in statistical mechanics, it becomes very, very clear what it means. So. I guess um, for, my, for my start of this uh, course, um, we start with the question of, of what is entropy? So the big question for the day is, in fact, this is the big question in my mind for the whole course. But once we start to understand what is entropy, then the whole thing starts to work. So in thermal physics, we learn that there is something else besides, uh, besides energy, right? So first year physics, second year physics, we talk a lot about energy and forces and uh, we've got velocities and all that stuff. And now suddenly there's something else, something new, entropy. Why do we need it? What is this thing? Why, what's important about it? Um, before we get into what is entropy, I would like to ask you a question because we've talked, to, you know, you've done with Paul and you've talked a lot about, about work and heat. Work and heat uh, both of them transfer energy, right? They both describe energy transfer. What's the difference between them? Someone give me a give me a guess as to what the difference between work and heat is. I mean, you've been using it for now four weeks solid, right? Nonstop. Yes. 
Work is macroscopic. Love that. Great. What does macroscopic mean in this context then? Definitely big, but how would you, is there a working definition of, of macroscopic? That, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. Like, it's kind of, we know what it is. It's like big is macroscopic, but how big? Like, is there, what, at what point, at what point does something not be macroscopic anymore? Anyone online could, should feel free to, to chuck something on the chat. Yeah. Indistinguishability. Yeah. Indistinguishability. Quantum mechanics is separate. I'm not going to write that one down, but it's not a bad idea. The quantum mechanics we'll get to in about two weeks time. And in quantum mechanics, everything's very, very clear. And all of the things that we've struggled with in statistical mechanics go out the window. It's, it's often the case with quantum mechanics. It's easier than classical mechanics. That's why I'm a quantum mechanic and not a classical mechanic because classical mechanics fi fixes cars and quantum mechanics is much, much easier than that. Um, in the instinctuality is a key aspect of macroscopic systems versus microscopic systems. Okay. I would say that there is a lot going on in here. One of the, the things is um, if there's a particle moving uh, with, a, with a kinetic energy and that particle stops, I would say, oh, that particle can do work. I can, I can get energy out of that particle. It has kinetic energy it's, it, and I can stop it and I can do work. Yeah. And that is true for someone hurling a brick. But it's not true for a molecule of gas in this room. Yeah? Why? What's the difference? Yeah. We'll get is it the question is, is it because heat he, he, uh, can only go from hot to cold and can't move it around? That is a result of the difference between heat and work, I would say. I don't think that works as a definition of heat. It's certainly an interesting and important aspect of heat, but that will come about from our definition of heat. Our heat, I would say that the difference here is uh, about our state of knowledge of the system. I think if I am a big lumbering uh, meat sack, uh, someone hurling a brick is about my size. I can see that brick. But if I, and I can't see the, the molecule of air, but if I was a molecule of air sized creature, then I might be much more sensitive to small currents and might live on a different time scale. And then I might be able to say something that you call macroscopic, I, microscopic, I might call macroscopic. So I, what I'm getting at, and we'll come back to this a few times in the next four weeks, is that there is a difference between work and heat that is about the state of knowledge of the observer. Yeah, that is wacky. And did Paul talk about Maxwell's demon? Hello? Not yet. Oh, okay. Well, it's, it, we, I won't either, but you can look it up. Maxwell's demon is like a fun thing that third year physicists like to play with anyway. So uh, Maxwell's demon is, is like, you know, the idea of like an infinitely knowledgeable observer. So there is an observer aspect to this. So whether I call something work or heat partly depends on my knowledge of the system. If I could define the positions and momenta of all of the particles, then I don't need to worry about heat. I can just, just use work and that's it. We're done. Yeah. If, I, if I'm in space and only objects are macroscopic, I don't need to worry about heat. There is no transfer of heat. But if I live in the real world and there are lots and lots of particles that I can't track, even in principle, then I need heat. So it's an important concept, but it's, really, it's important to realize that there is a... Um, there is an observer effect. So I'll just pop that in the notes. I loosely follow the notes that I've got. The first lecture of any series is, is a rant. When it's me anyway. Okay. So once we've decided what is heat and what is work, we defined heat. And uh, then we defined a change in entropy. Uh, define. So once we've got heat, the idea of heat, which I'm still not that happy with, but we'll, we'll get there. Define change in entropy. 
and this is, you know, I'm going through, I'm going through what we did in thermal physics. DS equals DQ over T. My apologies, but my notation isn't quite the same as, as Paul's. You can, you can point it out and I might try and change it or at least uh, make it clear. This DQ needs to be reversible. And then there's this one over T. Why do I need the one over T? What's that do? Why is it divided by T? What's the, what's the point of this division by T in this equation? Yes, ex thank you so much. Is an exact, exact differential. So we you can show that this DQ reversible over T in a reversible process DQ over T is uh, an exact differential uh, and therefore S is a state function. Doesn't mean I necessarily know what the function is, but it exists. I know that it exists. It's a state function. Okay, cool. Once I've known that S is a state function, I can then define temperature. How do I define temperature? I defined it. Define temperature. I think in thermal in thermal physics, I don't know that there's a better better definition for temperature. Um, there's definitely some different ways of writing it, and I think Paul writes it with energy is U in in Paul language. I usually use E because I'm a quantum mechanic. That is the working temperature definition, I think, in thermal physics. Am I right? Yeah. But this, I don't know. For me, this always felt circular yeah i need t to define s and i need s to define t this this bugged the hell out of me it still does i don't like it yeah you may has anyone kind of come to some sort of uh happiness with this with this circular definition has anyone reached some kind of like zen i'm cool with it yeah i, I haven't but um yeah so i you need to break this degeneracy somehow so this for me, this is circular and I don't like it. So statistical mechanics is actually trying to go from a different direction. Um, Paul, at the end of his lecture series, started talking about um, the connection between probability and entropy, and that's where we're going. I'm gonna continue with what Paul was doing there. Um, but the idea is that statistical mechanics is about establishing the connection between um, mathematical probability and entropy, and then what probability means is deeply linked to what I can think of as heat or work, what's a microstate, what's a macrostate, yeah? So the only time I need probability is when I don't know what's going on, agreed? If I knew what the result would be, I wouldn't need probability. So probability is deeply about what the observer says, uh, knows or does not know as well, right? Yeah. So in other words, I, if I'm playing, you know, roulette at the, at the casino, then if I knew what that ball was going to do, this, that we wouldn't be gambling. Yeah. We would just know where the ball was going to go. We don't know where the ball is going to go. There's an element of randomness to it or something that we can't define and something we can't predict. And therefore we have a probabilistic outcome. When I roll a dice, uh, it's the, it's the same thing. If I roll the die and there's a, um, um, you know, I've got a six-sided die and it has a one in six probability because I, I cannot predict where it will go. If I could predict it, it's no longer probabilistic. So that's about the observer. If I was some, uh, if there was some machine that was launching the die in a really controlled way and I knew how the die was going to land, then I wouldn't need probability. Yeah, it would go. And so I'd be a better observer. But you, who doesn't have access to the intricate workings of the machine that throws the die, for you, it might be probabilistic. Whereas for me, who controls the machine, it might, it might be entirely deterministic, yeah? That's interesting, right? Like, so probability itself is not an absolute thing. It's about the state of knowledge of the observer. Okay, this is a key part of statistical mechanics. There's a key difference between macrostates and microstates, heat versus work. It's about this idea that the observer has a, an active role in this. 
just to, all right. It is time to get started on the actual course material. This is just how I roll, just completely random tangents. Let me get used to it. So, uh, micro, -cano micro canonical distribution. Micro canonical distribution. Who's seen these words before? No one. Excellent. So this is what Paul's been doing. He just didn't use the words. So microcanonical D, and you, this is the one that you've already done. So for example, I've got a box, a box with adiabatic walls. What does adiabatic walls mean, everybody? Sorry, I can't hear. Insulated, insulated against what? Transfer of energy. Heat, transfer of energy, work. It's fixed. Inside my box, I've got some particles. Maybe this is uh, air. Maybe it's spins, something. So here's my example. Uh, gas in an isolated system. This is one example of the microcanonical distribution. The other one that you've already seen from Paul was spins. Yeah, I have a set number of spins and only those spins exist. Yeah, that's another example of the microcanonical distribution. We will find out what the canonical distribution is and the grand canonical distribution is later. Today, microcanonical. Uh, Maybe we'll get it to it later because it's a double period today, which is super annoying. But anyway, so much work. All right. So this is the microcanonical distribution. Um, N, V, what else is fixed? Energy, fixed. So I fix a bunch of uh, parameters. Um, maybe other parameters as well that we that we fix. Um, so this is defining the macro state. Macro state. Okay. Number of particles, volume, energy. These things are, the, yeah, you know, uh, the, the parameters, the macro state parameters. What's the micro state that corresponds to that? How, how, what are the thing? what are the, what are the variables I used to define the microstate here for lots of particles in a, in a, in a box? Yeah. Velocities, sure, yeah. Positions, yeah. The usual one we use are positions and momenta, yeah? And for those of you who've done classical mechanics, uh, it's, it's, it's QI and PI, for someone else, it might be XI and, and PI or something like that. So microstate, the microstate is all uh, positions and momenta specified. If it's three dimensions, then I goes from one to three N because there's three dimensions in the N particles. And each one of those has a position and each one of those has a momentum. Okay. How many parameters? I don't know, heaps. Maybe, maybe, I mean, 10 to the, I don't know, uh, maybe 10 to the 60 parameters. <laughs> okay. Yeah, if I've got 10 to the 20 particles, then I've got 10 to the 60 parameters to specify. Point is a lot of microstate for like one macrostate. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that you'll see in statistical mechanics is bigger numbers than you've ever seen anywhere else or will ever see again. Astronomical numbers are tiny now. What we say, when you say that's astronomical, that's a huge number. No, 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 no. This is, this is different scale. 
in, in mathematically here, when I say n goes to infinity, I mean really infinity. None, none of this 10 to the power of 20 nonsense. No, no, my infinities will be 10 to the power of 20 to the power of 20. Much bigger numbers. Immeasurably big, bigger numbers. So difference between microstates and macrostates. The microstates are just completely define the system, but I can't measure anything. Can't measure them. Even if I did measure all of these QIs and PIs at one moment, if I had like godlike powers, then a split second later, um, every particle has moved, interacted with the other particles, and now I don't know where they are anymore. Yeah. So the point is that uh, not only are these PIs and QIs not known, it's also pointless to know them. On the other hand, the macro states is stuff that I can measure, NVE. Maybe I can measure a few more things. Maybe I can look at one particular section of this and in more detail. And then I've got more information about the system. So that would add to my macro state knowledge. But in general, it's stuff that I can measure is uh, macro state. Stuff that I can't measure is micro state. So again, it comes back to this observer effect. Why is this called the uh, micro canonical distribution? I don't know. <laughs> the basic postulate of statistical mechanics. In physics, this is always how physics mechanics can it the basic postulate of statistical mechanics in physics this is how we roll right you start with some idea and then you see how that goes and the postulate may be something which is very very difficult to prove and maybe something that ends up being wrong but you didn't know that at the time some of the postulates that newtonian uh, mechanics uh, includes you know, like F equals MA or force has equal and opposite force or, you know, the Newton's laws. Um, other postulates which were implicit in Newtonian mechanics, like the speed of light is infinite or information is transferred immediately. You know, if you have a gravitational system, then the planet immediately feels what's happening at the sun at all times, right? These kinds of postulates, um, they were all in there somewhere. And then you develop a theory based on those popular, uh, postulates. And maybe those postulates are correct and then your theory is bang on forever, or maybe it's wrong at some point and you only find that out later. But that's how we roll. So the basic postulate, well, I don't know why I'm using so many colors, it's fun. I'll write it out in full because it is the only, maybe it's the only time I'll write anything out in, in full. But for an isolated, then there's always things, what does isolated mean? That's a good question. In equilibrium. What does equilibrium mean? Oosh. All microstates. Microstates that are compatible with compatible with by the way, if you want to just like download my notes in advance, uh, they're on they're on the the, the web. Oodle. So macroscopic constraints. So if I have some macroscopic constraints, then all of uh, the microstates that are compatible with it have equal probability. Okay. That is the basic postulate. Equal a priori probability. So without, if I don't know anything more, 
I have no, no better ideas about what's going on with the system except for this. A priori means at the beginning without having any additional information besides the fact that they correspond to a particular macroscopic constraint. All microscopes have the same equal probability. Um, this is incredibly difficult to show. One of the active directions of statistical mechanics today is to use numerical simulations where you like program Newton's laws for a few particles in a box effectively, maybe some, some disks in a box or something like that. And they interact in extremely simple ways. And what they wanna show is this, that eventually all of the uh, microscopes do indeed have equal uh, prob probability. That is an active current um, direction of statistical mechanics. So if someone can work out how to show this in general, then they will really change something in physics. But at the moment we're doing, people are doing numerical simulations with few particles to show that this is true for simple systems. Again, it's a postulate. We don't have any proof of this thing. It would be really funny if it wasn't true. Um, if it's not an isolated system, then um, then you're not in equilibrium um, because you can have energy exchange with the outside environment or particle exchange with the outside environment. So that's what the isolated means here. Um, the idea is that if I've got some system, a closed isolated system, and I leave it to evolve, then eventually it will go through all possible microstates corresponding to that macrostate. Oh, what's the use of that? Stay tuned for the next four weeks, my friends. Yeah, this is the beginning. What's the use is to define like all of this, the rest of this course. So everything will flow from this flow. Right, so uh, that's the basis of statistical mechanics. Um, right. And now we need to define um, some equilibrium. Equilibrium. Equilibrium, what's equilibrium? Uh, corresponds what we usually call equilibrium corresponds to maximal probability Whoop. maximum probability so if you have a look at paul's notes uh in lectures 13 to 16 like the end of paul's thing that that's what he's talking about the maximal probability You've done, you've done a lot with him already, so I don't need to go over that one again. Um, so in, in uh, the micro 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 canonical distribution distribution, uh, we have that S was equal to uh, K log omega. But omega is a function of E, V, N, and so on, right? So he did that, right? You've seen this one. Um, where, what is this omega? What is it? It's the number of accessible, number of accessible. Accessible here just means consistent with E, V, N. Microstates. So we've seen that already as well. Um, if I look at this, okay, so I know that there was some explanation given by Paul about this S equals K log omega, yeah? Um, for how many of you is that like something that's quite 
you're quite happy with this now, this K log omega. No, <laughs> yeah? You're a bit happy with it? The definitions was given and then there was some justification for it. Uh, it was extensive, uh, had other properties that Paul liked, increases monotonically, that stuff. Um, so K log omega, uh, why K log omega? I think that that's also the one that's on Boltzmann's tomb as well, wasn't it? The K log omega, yeah? Come on. Yeah, something like that. I think it was, I think it was almost this notation, Boltzmann's tomb. Yeah. Um, but this is for a particular system, isolated at equilibrium. In other words, it's for it's for this system, the particles in the box, the spins that are left alone, no transfer of particles, no transfer of energy, no change in volume. This is the simplest of all possible statistical mechanical systems. It's got lots of particles, or maybe not. Maybe it only has a few particles. The microcanonical ensemble is nice because, you know, if you just have a few particles, you can play with it. Like, you know, a few sided dice. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Or like a few, few particles in a box. Beautiful. The microcanonical distribution, S equals K log omega. There will be other distributions where we allow energy to flow or particles to flow between different systems. They're not the microcanonical distribution, they're a different one. And S equals K log omega will be incorrect. So the question that we're gonna to have to do is how do we generalize this? How do we understand S as the thermodynamic entropy? Like how do we connect it to thermodynamic entropy? And why does it look like this? Okay. Man, I go so slowly on the first lecture. I do this every single time. Uh, one of the answers to this is from Shannon's entropy. So Shannon's entropy is uh, one way to get around some of these issues. Shannon's, Shannon entropy. And it's a way of generalizing entropy. And Amazingly, this does not come from uh, a physicist. Shannon was a engineer and he was working on uh, communication theory. He wanted to know how much information I could get down a wire. And he wanted to, he was at the dawn of computing and he wrote this stuff in a, in a little journal, uh, the Bell Technical Journal, uh, and he wrote this paper called um, Mathematical Mathematical Theory of Communication. Nineteen forty-eight. The paper is quite readable. Uh, I've put it on the Moodle site. So you guys can have a little read of that if you want to. Um, it's quite long, but if you just read the first kind of 10 pages, it's really easy. And if you find the mathematics annoying, skip it. Um, it's kind of amusing. Uh, he does some, you know, and then you'll also learn what a, you know, Markov chain Monte Carlo is and stuff like that. It's quite cool. So what he was thinking of, like, uh, he wanted to define a, uh, a quantity to say how much information is being produced or delivered by a communication process. Okay, so there's going to be this is like an aside, and I, you know, uh, I don't apologize for that, but I want you to understand that it is, this is really an aside. Um, if I have uh, two, I have a, a someone speaking and someone listening and we're trying to say how much information is being conveyed yeah let's assume right that we're both very reasonable human beings who live on this planet and we're adults and all the rest of it yeah just a couple of us and i say to you um the sun will rise tomorrow how much information is being conveyed None because I already knew that is the correct answer. Yep, none. You've learned nothing. Why? Because 
the amount of stuff you knew before the communication and the amount of stuff you knew after the communication is exactly the same. Although you may be wondering about my own capacities as a human being, but it's another story. Okay, so what Shannon realizes is that um, the amount of information produced by communication uh, relies on like the resolution of some kind of probabilistic idea. So what he's trying to do is uh, have a set of probabilities, uh, but nothing is known about which event will occur. So for example, if instead of that, I said tomorrow, tomorrow's lottery numbers are going to be like 64, 23, 18, 4, and 55. Is there information in that? Heck yes. You're like, oh, I know that there is a set of events here. The number of uh, possibilities is astronomical, and you've just given me which one it is. Incredible. Don't ask how I did it, but the advantage to you is that now you're like, oh, okay, I can use that information. That's interesting information. I've learned something here. So what Shannon realizes is that, uh, and again, you know, linking back to what I was saying before about the state of the observer and how much the observer knows is like a key part of probability theory. Yeah, and therefore it's a key part of entropy and heat and all the rest of it. So if we have a set of possibilities, right? So we have a, a set, so, uh, we have have a set of, of, of possible set of possible outcomes. Yep. Uh, P1, P2, P3. These are probabilities. Yep. Maybe we have n n probabilities. Maybe n is an extremely large number. And the probabilities are known, but we know nothing about which event will occur. So we don't know. So what's okay? Event. What what is one person's event? Yeah. So so the language changes a little bit. Um, so the point is that uh, if there's no more information about which of these probability, which of these outcomes will occur, outcome one, outcome two, outcome three, outcome n. Uh, if there's nothing more known, we need to find a measure of how much choice is involved in the selection of the event or of how uncertain we are of the outcome. Okay. And so what uh, he wants to do is to find some measure some measure and in his paper it's called H and here I will use it S because um, physics, some function of these probabilities, which is a measure of the outcome. It's a, a measure of how much choice is involved in the selection of the event or of how uncertain we are of the outcome. So, for example, if we had a six-sided dice, we could have probability of getting the uh, one, probability of getting a two, probability of getting a three, probably getting four, five, and six, six possible outcomes, yeah? If we're talking about um, transmitting words through, um, through a telegraph system or through the internet, then we've got a set of letters. Those letters are arranged into words. Those words go down, down the wire, yeah? So at each step, there could be A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, blah, 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 blah. But he realizes that it's quite common that the letter T in English is followed by the letter H, right? Much more common than T being followed by a W. And so the, out, the probability of the H following the T is much higher than the probability of the W following the T, yeah? In other words, there is an information, the amount of information that's coming from that H is different to the amount of information that would be coming if it was a W. It's a different thing. If I said TH, you're like, uh, V. Yeah, come on, come on, come on. Like, I know what's coming, yeah? Uh, and so, you know, you can break it down to each step or you can think of the whole communication. Just depends on what you're looking at, but you want some measure of the uncertainty 
of this thing. Okay. Another example, stupid example. I love a stupid example, right? Uh, I've got a dog. You'll meet the dog because uh, I bring it to class sometimes. And uh, she's pretty obedient. And if I say she's listening, is information saying something to me? What? Stay? Sit? Probably one of those two. But there was already information in this. I, she knows it's not going to be take and she knows it's not going to be roll and she knows it's not going to be go to bed, right? She knows it's going to be something like sit or stay or one of those things. Which one? Okay, so I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that there is information being doled out in little bits and pieces. Why is that important? For the next bit. Okay, so we have this measure of the uncertainty, S. And then what Shannon says is, I have requirements for S, right? Have some measure. And then requirements for S emerge. This is what Shannon wants. S should be continuous in the PI. In other words, if PI increases by a tiny little bit and another probability goes down correspondingly because the sum of the probability should be one, then, but if it's a small change, then S shouldn't change very much. It should be continuous in changes of the PI. Does that look like a reasonable requirement for my measure of information, S? Second thing says, if all PI are equal to one over N, so if all of them are equal, so if all of the probabilities are equal to each other, then S, S should increase with n. What does that mean? It means that like, uh, what's an example of a situation where the probabilities of, are equal to each other? One example would be, okay, if I flip a coin, then there are two probabilities, heads or tails. Six-sided dice, one over six, six probabilities, each, each, pro each one has probability of one over six. 20-sided die, um, I've got 20, uh, uh, possibilities, each one has probability of one over 20, yeah? What Shannon wants is that a 20, he wants to say that a 20-sided dice has more uncertainty in its outcome, more choices, more uncertainty in its outcome than the six-sided die does, yeah? So there's more information contained in the outcome of a 20-sided dice than there is in the outcome of a six-sided dice. Yeah, or there's more information me telling you the lottery numbers tomorrow than me telling you the outcome of a roll of a six-sided dice tomorrow. Yeah, there's just more information. There's more, more possibilities, more uncertainty in the outcome. It's harder for me to convey that information somehow. Yeah, that's what he's saying. That seems reasonable. And the third one is about successive choices. And this one is like hard to write down. It's annoying. It says, if a choice can be broken into successive choices, then the original S should be the weighted sum of individual values of S. Selective successive choices. Let me give you the example that's in the Shannon book. It says, I've got three outcomes, right? This one has probability of a half. So I can say that the probability of this outcome is one half. This one has a probability of uh, one third, and this one has a probability of uh, one sixth. Yeah, so this is S of a half, a third, a sixth, using the notation that I used before, right? The notation I used is that S is a function of P1, P2, dot, 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 to Pn, right? Here I've got three choices. So S of the half, a third, a sixth. 
Okay. Now let's say instead of doing giving you and, and you know if we both agree that this is an interesting system for us to look at, and I'm conveying the information to you, I would say, oh, it's landed on this, you know, the second option. P2. You know, it's one third. Um, if instead of just telling you it's one, two, or three, I could instead make your life a little bit more difficult. I could say, uh, I could say first, it's either one or it's not one. So I say, it's not one. You're like, oh, just get over yourself. A half, a half. One or not one. Not one is not information enough to work out what's going on. If it's not one, I'm going to have to give you, you're going to say, which one of the not ones is it? Is it two or three? And you'll say, oh, okay. Uh, half the time I've given you that, and then, then you can split this up. Once you've gone to that point, this is now a probability of uh, two thirds. Now I get P2. And one third of the time I'm gonna say P3. Yeah, I split it up. And what is this thing? This is a two-step process. It's S a half a half, i.e. one or not one, plus a weighted sum, so half the time when I get the not one, I'm gonna to have to tell you whether it was two or three. Okay, so here is the exact same amount of information being conveyed, but in a two-step process. First, I say if it's one or not one, and then if it's not one, I tell you whether it was two or three, yeah? All the probabilities work out, it's exactly the same, but I've done it as two steps. What Shannon says is the amount of information conveyed in both cases is identical. So this is the successive choices argument. It's just easier for me to show it this way than it is to give you a like mathematical definition, but I encourage you to read the paper, it's entertaining. And what Shannon says, Shannon, and what he shows in the appendix, which I'm not going to go through, the only, the only S, the only function satisfying these requirements is S is minus K sum over I equals one to N probability I log E I. Incredible. So this is what Shannon showed. He said, this is the only possibility. And this is what's called uh, Shannon entropy. Um, K here is some thing, it's bigger than zero, is an arbitrary constant. Yeah? I don't really wear a watch. Uh, K here is an arbitrary constant. And basically what we'll see is that that just specifies units. Uh, same with the logarithm here, right? So, you know, if you've got log base E or log base 10, you can convert from one to the other with a factor. So if it's, you want to go from log base 10 to log base E, you have to divide by the natural log of 10. I may have got that the wrong way around, but you know what I mean. That can be absorbed into K, yeah? So K is the only, the only thing. So, for Shannon, who was interested in um, you know, communication using, using computers that hadn't been born yet, or they were just on the cusp of being born, there was the idea of bits. And so the probability of a bit is either one or zero. And so log base two made sense and k equals one made sense. And so the uh, probability associated with a bit would be uh, a bit to Shannon would be S equals 
minus k sum i is either zero or one pi log pi yeah and the probability of being up or down is a half so it's uh, minus k a half log a half plus a half log a half yeah and he made that equal to one by saying i'm going to take log base two and k equals one do the maths <laughs> yeah so that's that's just what, what what shannon did all right so s equals one for a bit um what we're going to do of course is going to get Boltzmann's constant in there instead but we'll get to that in a second okay so if you want the proof of that i've written it in my notes it's also in the um it's also in the uh uh in the paper that i put on the moodle it's now one o'clock so i think this is a good point to pause for a few minutes um I'm not sure if i should stop the recording or not did you just keep it going through for, an, for two hours get a two-hour thing on the on the on the youtube Oof. huh yeah actually that's true admin sucks all right so we just keep it running um yes yeah hit me up yeah That is such a beautiful and lovely question. The question is, why should S equal one? What does it mean to say that we have an uncertainty of an outcome? Um, what was the start of this lecture called? What is entropy? What is entropy? We're gonna to come to that. It's a really difficult, and I'm not sure I have a full complete understanding of it, but I have some good understanding of it, but and I'll try and impart some of that to you, but it's complicated. So entropy will be a measure of how uncertain we are of an outcome, okay? And so if I say S equals one for this process, it just means that there'll be another process where the uncertainty is more uncertain. For example, what's the outcome for two bits? And it'll be more than one. What about zero bits? It'll be less than one. Or what about something where we know the outcome will be less than one? Do you know what I mean? So it's just like, but for Shannon, the nice thing about the bit is that it was like, the minimum amount of uncertainty you're going to have one bit up or down which one is it okay that's one anything more is going to be anything else is going to be more than that as physicists we have to deal with continuum processes like lots and lots and lots of particles or spins or whatever it is we're going to have to do a little bit work a little bit harder but um yeah that and then the the link between yeah, Shannon's entropy and physics is non-trivial as well. Like, why is this uncertainty? But I think it comes down to our state of knowledge of the system. Yeah. Is that related to how we can't have a measure of entropy? I disagree because I think that you can't have an absolute energy scale either. Yeah. Yes. I agree with that. Yeah, I agree with that. You can't have an absolute entropy scale for the same reason. You'll find that you can have an entropy scale much easier than you can have an energy scale. Because if you define things at the absolute ground state and then start moving up from there, then that will define some kind of baseline to it. But, Having said that, their numbers are so uh, statistically large uh, that um, it, it's not so useful. The change in entropy is a lot more useful than absolute entropy, whatever that means. Yeah, like yeah, you know, we just don't have a lang uh, the language for we have you know financially large numbers or astronomically large numbers. Combinatorically large numbers would be the closest thing. Yeah, statistical statistically large. I need to find the right word for this one. If anyone comes up with that, let me know. The, 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 we have 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 10. How big is it? Probably there's like, there's something there. 
Sorry? No. 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 And 10 to the 10 to the 10 depends on which way you do the order of operations. I don't mean 10 to the 10, then to the power of 10, because that would just be like, you know, some number to the power of 10. I don't mean that. I mean 10 to the 10 in the exponent, and then you go that way. 10 to the power of 10 to the 10. Oof, silly numbers. And we just call them silly numbers. Mm. Here, if we get the um the power within a factor of ten, we're correct. It's like here it's like what's a few orders of magnitude between friends? We're going to get to a point, you'll see there'll be examples where the units don't matter because it's only, you know, if you use one unit or the other, you're only out by like, oh, you miss a factor of H bar and the unit's wrong. Now you're only out by 30 orders of magnitude. Ugh, whatever. <laughs> the units don't matter. These numbers are so large. Oh, you're doing it in centimeters and not in Fermi. Whatever. Same, same. Sorry? Do they fit? No. Oh my gosh. Of course not. Num Statistical mechanics doesn't fit in your calculator. You do. It's called mathematics. Midterm doesn't. I don't know. Probably not. Maybe. Have to talk to Paul about it. I don't know. It's a good question. Should I know the answer to that? Maybe. Okay. So the first person to write down that formula was not Shannon. Although Shannon provided a very interesting insight to us uh, by giving us this kind of proof. But Gibbs formulated it first. And it was S equals minus KB and then natural log. Sum of I, PI, log, PI. And that is our definition of entropy. So that will serve as our definition. It's the only sensible definition of entropy. Uh, why is it useful? Um, if we have this definition, then S is extensive. Uh, S is extensive. I think Paul already showed that, right? S1 plus S2 equals S for the two systems, right? Extensive. Um, S is the expectation value. It's an expectation value of minus the logarithm of PI. Right. In other words, if I take all of my probabilities and I take minus log p for all of them and I calculate the expectation value, right? If I have a set of outcomes, um, then the expectation value by definition is the sum of the weighted probabilities of those things happening. Yeah. So for example, my six-sided die, what's the, the expectation value of the outcome is one sixth 
times one, one six plus one six times two plus one six times three, and so on. So you get three and a half or whatever. Yeah. The expectation value of minus log PI, right, is this, is this S. Uh, oh, with a factor of K. Okay. K is going to be in there as well. Greater than or equal to zero, right? Always. That's why this minus sign, by the way, the minus sign here just comes from this minus sign. Hello, does that work? Yeah. This minus sign is just because all of my probabilities are between zero and one, right? Remember how logarithm looks? Between zero and one, it's all negative, yeah? So this minus sign here makes this positive. Yeah, that's the reason for it. Just want S to be positive. Um, and I would say finally that S is a measure of the width of the distribution. So if I make a histogram of outcomes with probabilities, then the width of that is like the is like the S, like you know how 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 wide is it? Right. So it's like uncertainty uncertainty of outcome. So make a make a little history. Right, we'll, we'll we'll get get back to a lot of that stuff. Okay, we're not done with the first lecture yet, which is kind of concerning, but not too bad. I'm always I always run late, especially on the first one. I rant too much. Back to the micro canonical ensemble. Mm -hmm. So back to the micro canonical ensemble. I've got S equals minus K sum over I PI log PI, right? And in the microcanonical ensemble, all of the PI equal one over the number of possibilities, which is a function of all the state parameters, yeah? Does anyone not understand why that formula, P equals one over omega? Where does it come from? The postulate, the postulate. The postulate was that the probabilities of all of these things are equal. In other words, I made that up. P equals one over omega. That is the postulate of the microcanonical ensemble. Nonetheless, let's plug it in here, minus K, sum over i equals one to n. The probability is one over omega, log one over omega, yeah? Equals minus k. Uh, I've got n of these things, right? Oh, n, omega. Omega, yeah, look at that mistake there. Sum up to omega. Omega possibilities, right? So K, so I can sum them all up. All of them are the same. So K log one over omega equals K log omega. Right. So good. We came back to the definition that we know from the microcanonical ensemble. In other words, that minus K sum over I P log P is consistent with K log omega for the microcanonical ensemble. It'll also be more general. So uh, if we have two macroscopic subsystems in thermal contact, two systems in, in thermal contact, what does that mean? Is that I have my Adiabatic space, Woo. yeah, two systems. And then I've got some wall here, which is diathermal. In other words, it can exchange energy through the wall. I've got E1, V1, N1 here. I've got E2, V2, N2 over this side. Yeah, this is a diathermal wall, diathermal.
everyone's like, why do you use uh, uppercase letters all the time? And then they see my lowercase letters and they're like, I know why you use uppercase letters all the time. So E1 plus E2 equals E. Oh, this is so much. V1 plus V2 equals big V. N1 plus N2 equals big N. Okay, I know that Paul has basically done this. And also, S1 plus S2 equals S. Sweet. Okay, we want to have the entropy is maximum at equilibrium. Paul showed you that already. S is maximum equilibrium. Right, S is maximum. Therefore, ds, de1, yeah, holding the total E, N, V, N1, V1, and so on. That And so on is nothing. That's it. So this is our system. We want to know how much so energy can go between them, but the volume can't change and the number of particles can't change. Yeah? Just energy. Energy is being exchanged. Right, I'll draw a little picture for later. Energy exchange. So this, the DSDE1 holding everything constant has to be equal to zero. In other words, it's at um, a stationary point. And DSDE1 is equal to the S1 DE1 holding all these things constant, V1, N1, plus uh, DS2, DE1, holding all these things constant. Grab this guy. Yeah. Equals DS, DE1. This is where it starts getting, starts to look a little bit like, like thermal physics for mine. But we have to just kind of have a look at a couple of these <clears throat> so that we know how to do them. The S2, the E2, V2, N2, DE2, DE1. All right, equals. DS1, DE1. Minus. What is, uh, where does this minus sign come from? Close. E equals E1 plus E2. The energy is constant. Therefore, D, and that should be DE2, DE1 equals minus one. Yeah. Equals constant. Make it pretty for the notes later on. Good. Yeah. And so if I look at this thing, I can now see that I've got zero equals this quantity minus this quantity. Those of you who've been paying attention in thermal physics will now say we can use this to define a temperature. Define temperature. D S I D T. Sorry, D E. My bad. D E I. Holding these guys constant. Equals one over T I. And so now we have at equilibrium T one equals T two. In other words, if I look back at this thing where I can exchange energy between the two 
uh, systems through this diathermal wall, then they will come to thermal equilibrium with each other. From my definitions, uh, they come to some kind of equilibrium when the entropy is maximum. And I define the temperature as DSDE equals one over T. Why one over T? Why not just T? Why this definition here? Why this funny definition? What's it doing? It is because of that. It's just because we wanted to be consistent with the physics that came before it. We do this quite a lot in physics where it's like something already exists, people are already using it. Let's just keep things like consistent with the physics that came already. That's why the, you know, it always annoys like uh, the year 11 physics student that the electron charge is minus one instead of plus one. But it's the electrons moving. Why can't they be the positives? I don't know, man. Like, leave me alone. Like, the reason is because we had like this whole, you know, electrodynamics that had been set up before the electron was even isolated. So leave me alone. Like, it's the, the negative charge, it turned out. Whatever. Same thing here. Why one over T? Because we already know what temperature is. If you start changing it now and then try and convince, I mean, Americans won't even move to the bloody uh, centigrade scale. They're not going to start going backwards on a temperature scale. Neither are we, frankly, right? Hotter. Hotter is hotter. Hotter is a bigger number. So there we go. T1 equals T2. Okay. T1 equals T2. What else can we do? All right, we can look at heat flux. Heat flux. Right. It require that dt, dS dt is bigger than zero. Why? Oh, that's a fun one. Which, which law of thermodynamics is that one? Entropy always increases. I think that's the second law. Is it second law? I think it's the second law of thermodynamics. Beautiful. The beautiful second law. Most fundamental out of all of them. I'm just, just kind of showing you how it comes from thermo, from statistical mechanics, you sort of can redefine, sorry, rederive the laws of thermal physics. This is kind of how it works. Yeah, using that same trick that uh, d e two d t equals minus d e one d t because the energy is conserved. So if t one is less than t two, then d e one d t is greater than zero. In other words, heat flows from hot to cold. How much information is in that last sentence that I've just given you? Heat flows from hot to cold. Zero, because you already knew that. Okay, cool, we agree. The, the entropy of this lecture is zero. I love that. Heat flows from hot to cold, okay. Why? Because we need this thing to be true because S has to increase. Another postulate though. Uh, similarly, you know what? I'm going to skip it. We can also do the same thing from pressure and chemical potential. Uh, please have a look at your uh, lecture notes and the lecture notes will say, uh, we can do it for pre pressure by considering a movable piston between our two systems. And then I say, show it. it's true for the chemical potential. And then you get to the definition of chemical potential. So you have homework besides the tutorials. I'll say it again. You have homework. It's at the bottom of this lecture. All right, that was lecture one. 
I'm only 20 minutes over time. It's all good. It's all good. All right. So that's kind of how we, that's kind of how that shakes up. Any questions at this point? It's a good point to stop. So we're at the end of the second, at the first lecture. Yes. 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 And then heat would not flow from hot to cold. Yes. Good, great. Good, good. Sure. Different setup. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's because it's an extremum. Here is an example where at equilibrium, it's a maximum. What we require is that the entropy is maximum with respect to all of the variables, yeah? Or at least is an extremum with respect to all of the variables. Um, so in going from the statistical mechanics back to the thermal properties, back to equilibrium properties, we will make use of it extensively. That's where we make use of it, at equilibrium. Any questions online? No, nothing. And this is unfortunate that you haven't had a bit of time to digest this information from this lecture. Because really, this is where the fun starts. I gave you the microcanonical distribution only one hour ago, and now I'm already like slapping you with the canonical distribution, which seems a little rough to me. What you've got with the canonical distribution is you don't just have one box, right? You had one box, only one box, and that box was uh, surrounded by an adiabatic wall and had a bunch of particles in it or spins or whatever or one dice being thrown or two die being thrown. Now what we've got is an ensemble of systems in thermal contact. Identical systems in thermal contact. What does that look like? Contacti. Eccolo. Contact. It means I've got a bunch of systems. These are all supposed to be identical. And so on. <clears throat> and now I connect them. So if there's a better drawing in the lecture notes. We can discuss what large is. We can connect them, for example, just by a thin wire that allows the heat to be transferred. Yeah. So each one is like adiabatic, but uh, has a few particles in there. Yeah, same number of particles in each one, but heat can flow. Heat can flow. Yeah. And this, this is the ith one. And how many do I have? I have a lot of them. I have a lot. They're really, they're really a lot. Uh, N systems. They're N systems. N is big. Maybe I'll underline it to make it extra big. N is a big number. How big? We're going to get to that. Uh, there, it's so big that there are ni systems in microstate, microstate and macrostate, microstate i, microstate, microstate i. So do you remember that thing that we talked about where we said, okay, we've got like one of these um, 
micro canonical distribution things. And we said, we've got EVN for the macro states. And then we said, um, to define the micro state, you need like 10 to the power of 60 variables, yeah? And so the definition of one microstate would be particle A's here and particle B's here going this fast, and particle C's here going this fast. I've got lots and lots of particles to the microstate. Now we need a system. We've got N, and N is so large that each one of those microstates, in other words, the complete specification of every particle in this room, occurs multiple times. How big is that number? If this, this should start messing with your head now. This should, if you haven't dealt with large, such large numbers before, this is, this is where your, your, your diaphragm should start reverberating. Yeah? There are NI systems in the microstate I. N is a huge number, folks. It's Avogadro's number to the power of Avogadro's number. This is silly. We're in silly season for numbers of microstates. Okay. So, uh, and that wouldn't be enough, by the way. We, we need more, more. So, there are NI systems in microstate I. Um, there are I different microstates. So, if I sum I over microstates, So sum over microstates, I've got Ni, they're in microstate one, N1, they're in microstate one, and N2 are in microstate two. So I is not the number of particles, I is the number of microstates. So it's each microstate. So, you know, lots of microstates. The sum of these should be a really big N. And furthermore, I would say sum over I of Ni. EI is the average energy, all right? So what we had before was that we had a energy was a fixed variable. In the microcanonical distribution, we had fixed volume, fixed number of particles, and fixed energy for each system. But now, now they can exchange energy, yeah? Now these guys can exchange energy. And so the energy could like flow into one of the systems or flow out from one of the systems. Yeah. So now you could have a situation where like one of these systems has a low energy and another one of the systems has a high energy. Why? Because that's just what happened. A little fluctuation, a little something, something. Yeah. So you have some average energy for each system. So the average energy per system is E bar. The probability of the microstate I is the limit. Definition of probability. The limit as n tends towards infinity of ni over big N. In other words, as I get more and more and more of these systems, as n gets bigger and bigger, right? I have, on average, the average number of, um, of systems that are in the microstate I is given by this probability. Definition of probability. Uh, so that the sum over I of the microstates of all of the probabilities of those microstates is one. You know that. And also, if I look at each one of the microstates and get the, the energy and multiply it by their probability, then I will get the average energy. So these are non-trivial statements. So here, I, I'm just going to say it again. I is summing over microstates. Microstates. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. 
Thank you fixing my mistakes for me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yes. So, uh, yes, I need the, the factor N. Indeed. Indeed. So, this defines what average energy is, and it defines uh, what the probability of the microstate I is. It's all kind of in this, in this, in this little cloud. Okay. Are we cool with this? This is highly non-trivial, right? We need a lot of systems to have multiple versions of every microstate represented. Yeah. with five so if i have like a billion systems big n is a billion and five of them are like up up down down up down yeah five of them out of a billion yeah so n i for that i up up down down up down is five yeah it's impossible to think about when you think about particles uh spinning around like ideal gas but it's much easier if you think of like a few spins. Yeah. A few spins seems like something that you could count. Okay. You have got like, uh, you know, I've got 10 spins. So I can work out that I've got two to the power of 10 different microstates. Two to the power of 10 is like a big number, but it's like what, a thousand or something? I mean, we can cope with two to the power of 10. Doesn't seem impossible. Yeah. Two to the power of 10 is a thousand. So we've got a thousand different microstates, 1024 or whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, and now I've got like, I don't know, a billion systems. So now each one of those microstates is represented lots and lots of times. Yeah. So this is a model of NI is the, the, just a label for, so I is a label for a microstate. NI is the number of times it appears in my ensemble. Yeah. It's the number of times a particular microstate appears in my ensemble. So I think, yeah, with spins, it's like a kind of something you can get on, 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 get your head around, right? If I've got three spins, for example, you might say something like, I've got up, up, down, I've got down, 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 I've got up, down, up, I've got up, up, down, yeah? So these three spin systems, for example, could be, um, could be the microstates. And I can see that down, 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 uh, N of down, down, down is equal to one here. Uh, but N of up, up, down is equal to two here. Yeah. And N of up, down, up is equal to one. Yeah. Out of these four. You with me? Okay. So this is easier to get your head around here. I'm um, lost. What was I doing? Okay, do that one. Good. Next. At equilibrium. This is going to get to the point of maximize it. Maxi maximize S subject to subject to sum over i of pi is equal to one and sum over i of pi ei is equal to e bar. Okay. I want you to think for one second how you might do that while I fix this. How do I do it? Uppercase P. So I want to maximize this entropy subject to those constraints. Does anyone know how to maximize a function? I know you know, all know how to maximize a function. You take the derivative, you set the derivative equal to zero. How do you do it subject to some constraints? Have you ever seen it? What? Lagrange multipliers. 
Lagrange multipliers. Lagrange multipliers. Okay. How do we do that? Here we go. Lagrange multipliers. We let some function f. It's like s, just s over k because lazy. f equals minus the sum of pi log pi. Right? I'm using a different letter. I'm using f, not s. Why? You see, because it's this minus lambda i, lambda one. Oh, Julian, lambda one sum over i of pi minus one, right? When we have that condition met, the sum of pi of pi minus one will be equal to zero, and this term will go away. When we have this condition met, this will also go to zero. So the method of Lagrange multipliers is to add your constraints uh, with a uh, prefactor, which I think is called a Lagrange multiplier, lambda one, lambda two. And now we take the differential of F, not S. So let's do it. DF, DPI. You get used to doing this. You have to do it yourselves a couple of times. This is kind of more homework for you. Take the derivative, right? How do you take, like, like we just said, we have to direct, take the derivative with respect to one of the PI, leaving all of the PI others the same, right? It seems really difficult, but it's actually not too bad because this PI is a specific case. Let me explain. Let's say instead of doing PI, let me just write P4. GF to P4. That's one of the possibilities, right? That's one of the probabilities that we need to maximize with respect to. Yeah. So if I look at this sum, in the first term there, there's uh, P1 log P1 plus P2 log P2. That doesn't, none of those have P4. P3 log P3 doesn't have P4. P4 log P4, that one has, yeah? P5 log P5. P10 log P10, all of the other terms, when I take the differential with respect to P4, are zero. So this dP4 is minus the derivative of P4 log P4. Same with this sum. This sum is P1 plus P2 plus P3 plus P4, right? When I take the derivative with respect to P4, specifically just P4, right? It's the derivative of just the P4 term. And the last part here, if I take the derivative of this PIEI, all of them are zero except for the one which has P4 in it, which is P4E4. Yeah. So in other words, when you do this, it's pulls out the term in the sum that you're differentiating that you're differentiating with respect to. Does it make sense? All right. So let's do it a bit more generally, right? I'll write df dpi, some particular one, is equal to, firstly, I need the derivative of uh, pi log pi. So derivative it's the same as the one above, just using i instead of four. So derivative of p log p, derivative of the first is one times the derivative um, times the second plus the second times the derivative of the first, whatever the way I probably just said it exactly wrong, but anyway, it doesn't matter. The point is you're gonna get minus, ugh, minus log p1, pi, uh, and then if I take P4 times the derivative of log P4, right? What's the derivative of log P? One over P. Multiply it by P, I get one. 
Yeah, you have to be able to do differentials in this course. If you don't know how to do differentials, you're going to have a bad time. Minus lambda one. What's the derivative of p i from that sum? It's one. It's done. What about the next term? Minus lambda two. What's the derivative here? E i. Yeah. This part here does not depend on PI, so it's zero. This part here never depends on PI, so it's zero, okay? So here is my differential, and I have to take that differential and set it equal to zero in order to maximize the probability. I need to do this for all of the PI. New page. New page log of pi is equal to minus one minus lambda one minus lambda two ei. All right, just going to go back and have a look at that one. All I'm doing is that set equal to zero. I'm just taking the minus log pi to the other side. So I get minus one minus lambda one minus lambda two ei on the left hand side, right hand side, whatever. We good with this? Okay. Okay, so that's my log of PIs. And so I could say, for example, that PI is equal to E to the power of minus one minus lambda one minus lambda two EI. Good. Now I just have to clean it up. Sum over I of all of my PI is equal to sum over i of e to the minus one minus lambda one minus lambda two e i. Yeah. All of the terms which have no i in them can go out the front. And that's equal to one because it's a requirement of the Lagrange multiplier system, right? So that was one of my constraints. Cool. My other constraint that I had was that sum over I of PI EI was equal to average energy. So let's put that one in. That one is equal to, pull out the term that's the same for all of them. Sum over I of PI EI. And what's that one supposed to be equal to? Average energy. All right. So this is the full system now. These are all the equations I have to have. And then I'm done. So I've solved it. I've solved it. I've maximized this F. Okay. If I have a look at these two, then there's this uh, minus, either minus one minus lambda one is common in both of them. So what I can do to, to get rid of that is I can just divide. I can divide. So I can write sum over I of E I, E to the minus lambda two E I over sum over I of E to the minus lambda two E I is equal to the average energy. Division. And furthermore, if I look at the first equation here with the sum over PIs, I could say that the sum over I of E to the minus lambda two EI is equal to one over e to the minus one minus lambda, which is e to the one plus lambda one. Yeah? That just comes from here directly. Okay.
So I've got two equations here. A whole bunch of equations on this board, actually. Uh, this is where it starts getting mess messy, to be honest. Okay, this is now about as far as I can go, all right? What I can write now is just to clean this up a bit. I've only got like 10 minutes left or less, so I'm just going to clean this up. Clean it up. PI is equal to e to the minus one minus lambda i, lambda one, sorry, uh, e to the minus lambda two e i. And that's equal to e to the minus lambda two e i over, and I just said that that thing is equal to sum over i of e to the minus lambda two e i. All right, so all I've done here is replace this term here with the denominator, yeah? According to this equation that I just wrote down on the previous page. Yeah, on the bottom right here, um, sum over i, e to the minus lambda two e i equals e to, the minus, e to the one plus lambda one. So that goes on the bottom. Um, this thing on the bottom here has a, a special name. The partition function written as Z. And usually lambda two is written as beta, which I will show in a minute, maybe. How far away am I from that? Oh, not too bad, actually. Maybe we'll get there. Okay, where Z equals are defined as sum over I of E to the minus beta E I is partition function. Terrible name, just, but we're stuck with it. Partition function. Don't worry about what it means. Just, just this. I, I really don't like the name. Doesn't matter. Okay. So, what we've just done is we have thought about. I'm just going to recap a little bit, and because uh, I think it's important, even if I don't quite get to the end of the lecture, it's okay. So, oh, where is it? <clears throat> Back to here. The canonical distribution. We have a set of identical systems in a row. They can only exchange energy. And they have all these different microstates I. And by maximizing the entropy subject to these basic constraints, that the weighted probability of energies, that the weighted energy is the average energy, and the sum of all possible microstates is one, and we maximize the entropy subject to those constraints using this complicated Lagrange multiplier stuff, and we get that the probability of the i microstate is equal to one over the partition function times e to the minus beta e i. In other words, lower energy states are more probable. Easy. Lower energy states are more probable. That's what this says. Yeah? The higher the energy of a microstate, the lower its probability. Yeah? The most probable case is the one that has the lowest energy. We need to relate this beta to thermodynamics still. But I just... And just to know if I've got the time for it today. Yeah, I want, maybe we'll stop there and I'll, get, I'll do that next. I'll do that uh, tomorrow morning. Um, because I think it's just better to ask, to answer questions and things now. We have this partition function. This thing is just a number, right? So for a particular possible set of microstates, right? This sums over all possible microstates. Sum over all possible microstates. 
sum over all possible microstates. So if we sum this over all possible microstates, yeah, and each one of those microstates has energy EI, then we get some number, which is the partition function. Some number, just a number, nothing fancy. And up here, this one over Z is just some number. So this is like a prefactor. It's an overall weighting. And it's the same for all of the microstates. So the probability of that microstate is some overall scale factor. Who cares? Some scale factor times this. What it means is if I take all of my microstates and I arrange them like this, find them the probability of I, and I take all of my microstates and I arrange them by energy. Yeah. It means that there is an exponential decay here. Oh, that looked terrible. Try again, Julian. That does not look like an exponential at all. I'm going to try one more time. Yeah? Where is the average energy in this thing? I don't know. Maybe here. Somewhere in the middle, yeah? Is the average energy. But what is important here is that I have, remember, a billion systems, all identical but thermally connected, yeah? And I wait until it's at equilibrium. And I don't have a few of these. I've got an incredibly large number of these, and I wait till it gets to thermal equilibrium. An incredibly large number of reasonably large systems, systems that can be de described statistically. And I've got this huge number of systems. And rather than each one of those little ones having the same average energy, which is what you might naively expect, I reckon they'll all, so you go, you go, I don't know, I'm going to put in like uh, some energy into this system. I reckon they'll roughly be evenly distributed. Not really. What you find is that the most common microstate is the one corresponding to zero energy. That's the most common. Yeah, it looks, the distribution goes like this. Yeah, there's some, some have more energy, some have less energy. Why? Why don't they all just have the same energy? Why has the energy not been evenly distributed? Why? What's going on? Any guesses? Tomorrow morning then. Cliffhanger. Why has it not been evenly distributed? What is going on? Work it out by tomorrow. See you then. Enjoy. <laughs> Thanks to those people at home. I'll see you all tomorrow morning, right? In class, maybe even. Who knows? Stranger things have happened. <laughs>